beginning of my video. Boom! Welcome back to Boring Reviews. Boring Land! Oh, Come just on. kidding. Blasphemer! Oh Hello, my. Boring Review Nation! <laughs> Hello, Boring Review Nation, Gabe, Nick, and we're here today to review a classic Indian film. Nick, do you want to tell them what the name of the film is? We are so excited to be able to be reviewing the movie Dwar. Now, Dwar means wall, from what I understand, either in Hindi or whatever language that comes from. And before we get into it, we got to send a huge shout out. Not that we got to. We get to send a huge shout out to Daniel and Gian's YouTube channel. You guys know who these guys are. I just like to say D&G to make it a little easier. We were able to get access to Dewar with, subtit with subtitles because of their very generous YouTube channel. So we just want to send some love, some shout outs to them. Thank you so much for making it happen so that we can check it out because we were struggling trying to find a, a copy of this film with subtitles. It's on YouTube, it's different places, but the subtitles weren't there. So thank you so much to that YouTube channel. And we're excited to check out this 1975 classic, 1975 classic. I cannot wait to talk about it. This film, when, me, when I went into this film, uh, maybe you as well, I'm not a huge fan of classics, whether it's Hollywood classics or anyone classics, because the special effects aren't gonna be there. This isn't gonna be there. The things I'm used to aren't gonna be there. The, um, all these different elements are kind of lacking with those classic films. I was not excited to go into this film, but I knew it was so many people's favorites. And I'm telling you, I was waiting. I was watching the entire movie. I was waiting for it to become a classic film and be kind of boring and drag on. This film did not. This film kept my interest from the beginning. There were some certain elements. I'll just get this out of the way right now because I absolutely love this movie. There were some elements that were outdated. And most specifically, the fight scenes. The fight scenes were outdated. The fight <laughs> scenes were not the best, but it did not ruin it, the movie for me. I accepted those for what they were because the way they set up those action scenes, the way they set up the fight scenes, the, um, the epic value to those fight scenes that was in the setup, the buildup, was more than enough to overcome the outdated action um in those scenes that's my biggest complaint i'm gonna get it out of the way right now so i can get all that negativity out of the way why don't you start off with any negativity that you may have for this film before we talk about maybe you don't like it that much i'm ready to gush about it though no no i, I agree with you i think for me similar the fight scenes are outdated but i could accept it because like you said the build-up to them were really was really really good and specifically the warehouse scene which we're gonna spend some time on later I'll tell you why I love this scene so much. So that didn't bother me. You know what? For whatever reason, even at the very, very end, when, spoiler alert, oh, okay, this is going to be a spoiler review, when my man Big B gets shot, okay, he's leaking, the blood, it was like red paint. And it was all throughout the movie in the very beginning when his dad gets beat down. Like, it bothered me. And I was like, and I'm thinking, okay, 1975, maybe it's because back then to get a certain um, a, a rating, they couldn't use like anything that looked like real blood is the only thing I can think of. You know what I mean? Because even some American 1970s and 19, uh, late 70s, early 80s um, horror films, whenever there's blood, you know, I know they use the corn syrup or whatever, but it looks like blood. Here, there were so many times where it just it, it looked blatantly like red paint. And I'm like, is that like a directorial cha uh, um, choice or is it something to do with the rings where if they look anything that looks like real blood, then they have to like go from whatever a rated uh, uh, G13 to like a rated R G17. What I mean, but other than that, those were the only the two things that bother me, you know. The acting was absolutely superb. Normally, I focus on, on, on just the main character or one or two characters. Uh, uh, Anita, Anita, who's played by um, per, uh, Perveen Bobby. Perveen Bobby. She was amazing. She was amazing. She was right or die, man. Oh, oh, you know what? <laughs> okay, I'm going all over the place. So let's do this. 
Nick, you want to give because you were so impressive in the Star Wars. Do you want to give out give a quick five six minute synopsis of the film, and then we'll talk about our favorite parts and uh, um what interests about the film. Yeah, just to review the few things that you said. First of all, I've seen that kind of low level fake blood and, and even American films from the seventies and eighties before. Um, so I'd seen it before, so it wasn't too much of a drawback. I have to disagree. The acting was fantastic, especially Amina Batchman. He was put on a master class. But I will say that the, the actress that played Anita, I accepted it because it was the tone of the movie. I felt like she was overacting to our standards today. And I felt like, um, you know, her boyfriend, obviously, our man Ravi, he who was played by Shashi Kapoor, this guy is a great actor. I felt like sometimes he had that kind of like over the top boyish type, um, giddy boy type personality. And he, he darkened, he softened throughout the movie. But at first I was like, I'm not sure if I'm digging this over the top acting. I was fine with it because it's not the first time I've ever seen it before. And it, it was not bad acting. It was just like you said, the style, maybe the director's choice. I don't know. But I'm going batch of acting would hold up even to today's standards. So, Quick synopsis of this film. So you have this movie where we start off with this mother, this husband, and their two little boys. And the husband is like basically um, a normal Ray. He is fighting the union fight, trying to get better work conditions for their, their workers. And he is given a lot of respect and clout. He goes and he negotiates the terms with the big boss who I thought was gonna be the villain in the whole movie. This guy's only for a few minutes. And that guy basically blackmails him as badly as you can, steals his wife, kidnaps his wife and his kids. They're all going to die unless you go back out there and you tell them that you gave them into my demands, which means you guys get no raises whatsoever. And so he has to agree to that. He goes back. He's seen as someone who's a turncoat. His whole life is ruined. He can't handle that his status has gone way down. And so he just leaves Dodge. And I thought at some point, besides what we get, he was going to come back in the picture at some point, but he's just gone. He leaves his family. He can't handle the um, disgrace. The older son, VJ, who Amanda Batchman plays later on, he they put a tattoo on him when he was a kid, saying, "Your my father's a thief." Um, they beat him down, man. Girl, oh, man. Yeah. Wow. That was hard to watch. I don't think I've seen too many scenes like that where a kid gets beaten up um, by locals in a 1970 movie. So that was pretty unique. And so anyways, the mom is left to take care of these kids and they go, she goes on and they're trying to, they're living under the bridge for some time. They're in poverty. She's trying to hold a job. She's not able to do it too well. And they're struggling very, very badly. And then it fast forwards and the whole movie is about these two brothers. And we've seen this kind of story before, but I wonder if Dewar was one of the first ones to you know, make that thing in film where you have these two brothers who care about each other. They love each other. They're connected by the love for their mom but they chose two different paths. You have VJ who shows the gangster path and it wasn't like he wanted to be a gangster, but he tried doing the honest work. He was just sick and tired of having to give his money to the gangsters. And so he's like, you know, you can't beat them, join them. And I'm going to do a better job than they can. And then you have Robbie who is, feels like he's destined for greater things. He's not able to get a job. So he gets into the police force and he's able to get into the academy and they kind of slowly separate. The thing I loved about it, and that's basically the synopsis, they eventually have to go against each other where Robbie has to take this case to try to go after VJ and the mob and they know that they're gonna butt heads and they're gonna collide. The thing I loved about this movie, the biggest thing I loved about it was it did not follow this, the similar tropes that I thought it would, which I wouldn't have blamed it because this is a 1975. This is one of the OGs. I would have no problem it falls on the similar plot line tropes, but it didn't. It went into areas that I did not think it would. The brothers didn't instantly hate each other just because they were on opposite sides of the career spectrum, so to speak. They still cared about each other. It wasn't until their jobs made them go at odds with each other where they did, but they never went too far to for no reason. I hate you now. I hate when movies do that. I thought that the character development and the way the story went was unique and it was a breath of fresh air and it was nice to go on that journey because I did not know what was coming next. Okay, thank you. You are amazing with these quick reviews, I'm telling you. And I thought I'm the one that talks quick. I talk quick, but I talk too much. All right, here's the big Sometimes thing. Sometimes I don't have a choice to talk fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. About this movie. Like you said, bro, this is the original. And just right off the bat, okay, this is probably one of the best examples of foreshadowing 
that they've they've shown in films that I've ever seen. One example is how when Big B, right, as a little kid, is shining shoes, and then the big gangster who I hated oh, that, that guy. Awesome. I even wrote down his name. It was uh, uh, Jai Chan. He's a punk, and he throws the money down. And BJ's like, "Give me the money in my hand." As a little kid, we're talking here, shoe shining. He's already mind you, he's already been beat down. He's gotten tattooed on his arm that his father's a thief. So this kid has no fear, and he's like, "Listen, I'm not out here begging. I'm working for it. So you treat me with respect and give it to." Me. And then Jachi's um boss, uh, Dever is like, "Yeah, he's right. Give it to him." So he picks up the money, puts it in his hand. So as they're walking away, Dever's like, "Listen, that kid right there someday will be somebody. That kid right there." And it's not like he followed him around and wanted to make him somebody. He was just like, because of his character you're gonna see that kid make do big things spoiler alert he grows up to become uh, um uh, uh, uh vj who's part of this guy's crew eventually so that was one thing right there another thing um that we're talking about is how he really becomes a gangster he doesn't initially go into a life of crime because oh what happened with my father and I got beat down and, and the tattoo. It was a, a, a culmination of things, right? So they showed great character building. It just wasn't like, for instance, uh, what was that movie with the two brothers with Van Damme played both of them and one was automatically bad because he was raised by the gangster and the other one was automatically good? No, they yeah. showed how the kids, for the most part, went through the same struggle, saw their mother struggling, like you said, sleeping under the bridge. One just went down a different path and the other one was just tired of, he saw a guy the day before get beat down because he didn't want to give up his money. And he's like, the guy's like, you know, I've never seen that in a, a, a thousand years. So VJ says, well, get ready to see it because tomorrow I'm not giving up my money. And when he goes and <laughs> doesn't give up his money, the guy's there, one of the best scenes, all right? The guy's like, oh, give me the money. He just uh, smacks him in front of everybody because you're all talked up. It, it, it's always a, a tough talk until you got to actually stand up and do something. So this guy that was pretend gangster, he's just collecting for gangsters, gets smacked. So... They're looking for VJ, okay? Anyways, and they're all running around looking for VJ. The other guys from the union tell uh, um, VJ, um, hey, they're looking for you, whatever, whatever. And he's like, they're looking for me? Okay, look, where, where are you going? I'm going to look for them. You know what I'm hiding from, everybody? Now, now, before you say it, this is honestly one of the best scenes and sequences that I've seen in any Indian film and in any film period in this genre, this guy is such a boss when he does this. And Amina Batcham plays it off so well, the actor, in this scene where, again, some of the action, I mean, he's flying with drop kicks and whatnot. Some of the action is a little outdated, but this is such a boss scene that when this was unfolding and then when he opens that door and walks in, I mean, I was just so excited. I'm like, yes, go get him. I thought he was going to die. But I was like, yes, go get him. It was just an awesome scene. <laughs> well, he's sitting back, right, in the corner. He's smoking a cigarette, and then everybody's looking for him. He's like, he said, you guys been running around looking for me. I've been here waiting for you. So <laughs> this scene is absolutely amazing. So he gets up or whatever. Everybody's like, there's all these thugs, and it's just him. And then he goes and locks the door and throws the key to them and says, I'll leave, because they're telling you, you got to... I'll leave when I come and get that key from you. Gangster, by himself, right? I'm like, oh, the guy throws a knife at him, he moves, pulls it off the thing, closes it or whatever, throws it back to him. Like, I don't even need your knife. Like, like this scene to me was reminiscent of one of my favorite scenes in Hollywood of all time. It's in um 1993's A Bronx Tale. I grew up in the Bronx. That's why I love this film. I actually lived in Little Italy right around this area. In any event, really, really quickly, Charles Palmonteri, Robert De Niro, um, Charles Palmenteri's uh, character's name is Sonny, okay? And Sonny in this in this specific scene is, he owns a bar. And there's these bikers that go all around town, get really rowdy, bust up bars. They're known for doing it. So they go to Sonny's bar. Sonny is a mafioso. He's a mafia head. And they go into his bar. So Sonny's calm and collect. They said, we're just here to get some drinks. He said, you're here to get some drinks? Okay, get them some drinks. So the bartender gets some drinks and then they start shaking up the beer, busting up the bar, whatever. So Sonny says, okay, now I offer you guys a drink like a gentleman. You guys got to go. And they look at him, these bikers, and they say, we're not going anywhere. They start tearing up his bar. So he goes to the door, very calm, locks the door, turns around and says, and now you can't leave. I promise you, this was 1993, so they must have stolen this from this movie, bro. The director had to have seen this movie because it's like mirror everything. I've never seen that in any other movie where you locked the door on them and said, no, now you can't leave. I gave you an opportunity, now you can't leave. That was 
awesome. In any event, and maybe Nick, you can clip it in here real quick for, for the fans, or at least put it in the comments so they can check it out. But it's so similar. To make a long story short, he yes, the action is campy in here because it's outdated, but just his mannerisms, everything leading up to that is absolutely amazing. After the fight, now he's respected around town. This other guy, Dever, is like, okay, well, I'm actually enemies with um Samant, his name was right. Yeah. It's I'm also, I'm actually enemies with Samat, so we can help each other. You know, my enemy's enemy is now my friend. So they go into business together, and that's how he becomes a gangster. Not because that's just something he chooses. Well, his his epic moments continue because when he's like in the boardroom, so to speak, with Devar's men, they're like, okay, we're gonna put this thing together and we're gonna apprehend this or that. And he's like, no. He's like, no, I'm gonna do it. I don't need no one else's help. I got the, oh, are you sure? Are you sure you're kind of a rookie? I got this. You know, Devar's friend, especially the one guy that you can't stand, me neither, that threw the money down at him. He's like, uh, you can hear, you can see like his mind working. Like, this is not how it works. What, who this guy think is? I, I got it. Don't worry about it. And he just totally takes care of the entire situation. Then he goes to Samant and he does the old switch through double agent thing where he's like, hey, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to take the money. I'm going to bring it to you. But you make sure you pay me some money and I'll take the money right now or I'll take it later. I don't care, but you're going to give me some money too. And so he's able to, you're not sure, okay, whose side is he really on? And then he steals money from Samant, takes the money back, gives it to the VAR. I mean, this guy just has all these plans and all these things that work out because he has no fear. And things are finally starting to work for him. And it's just, it's totally interesting. There's so much we can talk about with just this character. But there's so much else, so many other things going on in this movie. You have the mom's character arc. That was a very interesting character arc where she's trying to survive. And then eventually she relies on her sons to help her get through it. And they both become successful in their own way. You have the whole Robbie story where he's got some pride. He wants to get a job. He has that one job where they offer him way below what he thinks is worth. And he's like, forget that. I don't need that. Give the job to this other guy. And the other guy is so thankful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And he is, his whole character story is interesting too. So when it cuts to different character sequences in this movie, you are behind those characters. You are interested in what's happening. You don't exactly know what's going to happen next. And especially with Robbie's character, even though some of his overacting I wasn't a huge fan of, I think he goes through the most, the biggest character arc, because from where he goes to to where he ends up is in a completely different place, and his eyes are open. You can go to VJ's character arc where you're talking about the steps walking up and being become a little more religious through the whole process and being respectful of that. There's so many different things going on. The last thing I want to say um, on this matter is this is 1975. Amin Abachum had this movie and Cholet that same year. Can you imagine how his superstar just shot up? And Cholet was kind of a sleeper hit, but it still didn't take too many months before it blew up. This guy had an amazing 1975. He blew up, and I can see why, because this movie, he absolutely blew up, and he's a scene stealer. Um, Again, I have to disagree with you a little bit. I did like Ronnie's... Uh, uh, um, overacting to 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 an extent, and I know what you're saying, but it was so much like he was almost like a thespian, if that if, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? He delivered his lines. You could see the pain in his eyes. And one of the things, like you said, he did go through the biggest character arc because he comes this cop and he's got you know this this very convoluted sense about what justice is and then one of his very first actions is to try to stop this thief he's you know yelling stop 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 to the thief shoots him and the thief is selling it, it, it was stealing bread and when he realizes like oh my gosh i just thought some shot somebody that was just trying to steal a uh, uh, food to survive you know remorse kicks in so he goes and takes bread to this guy's family that was probably one of the most amazing parts of of his character arc where he goes there and the family is like what what happened and he said you shot him so the wife gets upset whatever but the the, the dude's dad is like look if you whether you steal a penny or you steal a million dollars you know Stealing is stealing, so I don't fault you for what you've done. But he goes and takes the family bread, and he realizes how things aren't so uh, 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 black and white and how there is a shade of gray, so to speak. And that also plays a role into you know his relationship with his brother later on. Going back to VJ, though, one of the things I definitely wanted to touch on him was – you know how they say sometimes people are born with a lucky rabbit's foot? This guy had a, a, a lucky uh, a, a union badge. His union badge got him out of trouble <laughs> so many times. 
But this is, again, a great job of foreshadowing by the director where every time he's got the badge, right, they got the one ass assassination attempt on him, right? What happens? The, he leaves the badge at the bar. The girl, Anita, is goes to return it to him, right? When she dropped it on the floor, he bends down, boom, they shot out the glass of his car. He was about to be assassinated out there, all right? The badge saved his life there. And on se uh, on several other accounts, so he even tells well, the story of, like, when he went to go um, deal with all those other guys, how the badge saved his life. But then at the end, when he finally ends up dying is when he loses the badge, right? He doesn't have the badge. So... It, it, it's just foreshadowing that that was like his lucky rabbit's foot, so to speak, or his, his lucky totem. But I thought that was super, super cool. Um, Let me clear you know, one thing real quick. I said in Anita, I thought was overacting. I was confused with the two girls. I meant Vera or Viru, um, Robbie's uh, girlfriend. I thought Anita was fantastic. She was absolutely amazing. She did not overact or have any acting issues whatsoever. I just want to clear that up. Um, okay, yeah, because I was like thinking about when I say well, my notes here, this is exactly what it says about her. I love the need of this character. She was right or die. Now, but I say right or die, I mean, she was loyal to a fault, right? At the very end of the movie, uh, which you saw coming from the beginning, because like you said, you could see uh, Jai Chan's um, um, wheel spinning, right? When BJ's coming up through the ranks and he's the first one to snitch. He gets caught by, caught by the cops and then he snitches. So now the cops have warrants. For uh, Dever, Dever gets arrested, and they're not everybody's looking for uh, um, VJ's character, Adam Batcher's character, VJ, and he's in hiding. So he's in hiding, and everything is. He wants to go see his mom who's in the hospital, but the cops are all around his hospital. Again, his brother's a cop. So he does the one thing that, again, foreshadowing. I love this film. Earlier on, his mom as a little kid was trying to take him into the temple, into church, and he refused. He didn't want to go to temple. He didn't believe in God. What's God done for us, right? So the, the, the priest or guru, who the guy that's there tells him, don't force religion on him. Don't force spirituality on him. He'll come when he's ready. When was he ready? When his mom was about to die. And he goes, and first he's arguing and yelling with the God, and he's like, no, what did she deserve to do this? And his mom survives. So that's, again, an, another layer to this film. It was set up. Everything pays off at the end. My point was that when uh, the, the way they end up getting to VJ is, of course, through, and that's why when you're in that lifestyle as a gangster, you can't have a family. You can't have a, a wife because their weakness. They find her, beat her down. She's pregnant with child. And Samat, uh, Samat I believe his name is, the the, the, the main gangster that um, Amadam Bacham's character uh, double-crossed in the beginning he ends up killing her. So she goes and she says, I didn't, her strongest line says, I didn't tell them anything. I didn't give them a word. As she's dying, man. That's what come out. I was like, what? You didn't like her? I loved her character. She was right or die, bro. No, she oh. was fantastic. And this movie made me, I was heartbroken several times throughout this movie, especially that scene where you have the implication where he finds out that she's pregnant. He is just so excited because you can tell without him saying it, you can tell that he's thinking, I'm going to be a better dad than my dad was. I'm going to be there for my kid. I know I've made some mistakes. I'm getting out of this life and it's going to be everything for her and for my kid here on forward. And I felt like that was his way to um, make amends with the decisions he had made in the past, but he doesn't get that opportunity. And his wife and his unborn child or his fiance, whoever she was, they both end up dying. I mean, that was heartbreaking. There's times when, like you said, he goes to those steps and he's arguing with the God. I mean, so many people have been in that situation in their own lives, whether you're religious or not, where you are arguing with God, like, how did you allow this to happen? Even though you know better, you're just frustrated. And it made me think of those times. There was uh, other situations where I was pumped up and adrenaline was pumping. I'll see like Roadhouse or something like that when he goes into that bar and he starts fighting with those. And then you have Ravi who has his awesome moment too, where he doesn't have a gun. He has no time to get a gun. He's got to get these people right now and he's got to go after them. And these people are going to eventually go after VJ. He doesn't really realize that, but he's got to go after them. And so he just tells the biggest lie ever. And he, they're like, well, what are you going to do about it? We have guns, you don't. And he's like, that's fine. You can shoot me down, but I got a whole crew out there waiting for you and you're not going to stand a chance. Or you can give me your gun right now and you can go away peaceably. It's up to you. And he was totally calling a bluff. And I loved how the writing happened because I thought what was going to happen was when they gave the gun. And when that happened, I was cheering inside. Like, yeah, you fell for it. What I thought was going to happen was when they got the gun and the guy even says, 
You were lying, weren't you? There were no cops out there. I thought there weren't going to be anyone for a while. But again, the screenwriter, the director threw me for a loop because then they showed up with their sirens and you could hear them. And so there was just so many elements in this movie that even though it was 1975, even though the action wasn't great, it did not ruin the movie for me whatsoever because of how it delivered stuff. And that's what I'm talking about with the character arc of Robbie. He doesn't want to go after his brother. He doesn't want to hurt his, his mom's son or doing like that. He was so happy-go-lucky before. He has that transition where at first they're hailing him as his great cop just because he finished the academy and he got great marks and he was a smart guy, but he hadn't proven himself yet. He made that mistake with shooting the guy who sold the bread, but here he proved himself and it wasn't through bumbling. It was through actually doing some and he was able to feel more secure. That acting I do appreciate. I still hold on my sentiment though on his acting earlier on where I get he was being naive. I just felt like he kind of laid it on a little thick. A fun fact I just found out by looking at it before we did the review, the lady that played the the character I didn't love too much, Vera Viru, her name is Nitu Singh. She eventually married a Kapoor, and her son is the actor that played Barfi, which I thought was just kind of a fun, cool wow. coincidence. So, I mean, the Kapoor family is a huge you know, <laughs> royalty. The guy who played Ravi is another Kapoor, not the same one she married, but a different one. Anyways... This movie made you feel so many different things. It brought you along on the journey. And again, it's so rare for a 1975 film to hold up in this day and age. Um, the ending was just excruciating. It was hard to get through, but it was understandable. I didn't feel like the people making the movie did it just to give you a sucker punch and like, ha, oh, you didn't expect this coming. I felt like it had a good enough transition to get there. And once again, Amina Batcham, his acting, I don't think I've seen him in a better role. And that includes any of the more modern stuff I've seen him in, like in Battle or Pink. Right, right. He is, and he's even better in this movie than he is in Sholay, even though his fate is kind of similar and his character is kind of similar. Right. He puts on such a performance in this, in this movie. Um, there's just so many elements in this movie that are my favorite elements. I love when he decides when he's working for that company, you know, I'm not going to pay him back anymore because he sees that one guy get killed for not paying. He's, you know, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to make sure it worked. I love um, the transition with Robert. Like you said, with the bread going back to the family, the mom was not going to forgive him, but this, the dad, like what you said, he's like, I understand. There was just so much involved. And even when they find the dead body of what they find out to be their father that was on that train, train they all right. feel it. there's just so many emotions that you feel in this movie that it makes it such a watchable film in 2020 and such a like likable film. You know, talking about his dad, right? We almost skipped over that story arc, okay? And it was super small because his, his, his dad was this proud union leader. And then he walks in there ready to negotiate. And guess what? You know, they had the upper hand on him. They had his family. He goes ahead and sells out his entire union. He gets beat down as well. He gets put into the hospital. But he's never... He might have been able to physically recover from that, but he never mentally recovered from that because his whole life he lived as a beggar. He lived on the streets. He was uh, riding this train to nowhere, and he eventually ends up dying on this train. And one of the things that really struck me about it is if he had left his family and started off a new life somewhere else just to get away from it, you would have said, oh, he was just running away from what he did. But he was just running away from himself, man, because he never recovered from that. And that was such a great... Uh, 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 how would I say for the director to not forget about that and keep those uh, images of him and then how they bring the entire family back at the end between uh, um, Robbie, between uh, VJ at the funeral for his dad. Cause his but Robbie's like, you know, we got a, 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 a a guy that's not claimed, right? Because he's a cop. So that's how he finds out his dad dies on the train. He didn't know who it was until they showed him a picture. And it was him as a little kid with his mom and his dad. And he's like, no, this guy's not him claimed. I'm claiming him. This is my father. And it was power. That's what I'm saying. He had some very powerful uh, um No, he did. Uh, Again, I don't think he's a bad actor. I just thought it was a little over the top earlier on in the film. One thing that I want to address was the tattoo that VJ had about your father's thief. It, it played in such a big role in many aspects. My favorite way it was played in, like you're talking about callbacks and whatnot, is when he finds out that his girlfriend's pregnant, he's looking at that, that tattoo. He himself is a criminal. 
and he realizes I'm not going to let history repeat itself. I'm going to quit, get out of the game, and I'm going to not be that for my son. So no one can say that about me to my son. I thought that was really cool. And that's what happens as a parent. You get inspired by your kids. You get inspired to change and be better. And, you know, it obviously it wasn't different 50 years ago. Right, right, right. Two things, right? As I always talk about how the writing in Tarantino's movies are amazing, specifically the monologues. A lot of people hate monologues because usually most monologues are bad. That's not how people talk. It's so boring. It's so monotonous. But the two, there was well, one monologue when his brother tries to get him to turn himself in. And he said, I'll turn myself in as soon as, you know, you get the guy who kicked mom out of her job or the men that beat me up and rolled <laughs> down or whatever. That one monologue there by Adam and, by Big B is amazing. And all his brother keeps saying is, are you going to sign it? And he had that one line. That was such a great interaction. Then when he brings them back at the very end and they're at the underneath the bridge, and he says, you know, I brought you here. And he goes, because you won't go to my house and I won't go to yours on principle. He's like, no, because this is, you know, where as kids, we slept underneath this bridge. This is, you know, where we grew up. This is where our connection was, where we forged that bond. And it was really, really striking. I, I just remember how he said, uh, how Big B says, am I talking to a criminal or am I talking to my brother? And his brother says, if a brother's talking, then a brother will listen. But if a criminal's talking, then a cop will listen. Like that goosebumps you know what I mean like they both held their own on that scene I was like oh my gosh this is acting again if it wasn't for a little bit of a blood if it wasn't for like I said it's the campy fighting scenes but you can get past it because it was 1975 one other thing I was gonna say most parents won't admit it but who's your favorite okay that whole thing with the mom we don't haven't talked that much on the mom yet but she loved bj but she says i didn't i don't love him because i walked in wide eyes wide open i know who he was what he was born through what he was uh, or he what he went through which is why i love him more and like as a sibling growing up i won't say who because my brothers all watch this channel but we've all had the running joke of Who's my mom's favorite? Okay. And it's always the one that gets the most trouble, but it's because that's who the mom suffers the most for. You know what I mean? And, and, and the fact that they put, even put that in there, dude, oh, there's just so much to talk about this film. If you have not seen Dewar, go watch it. This movie is absolutely amazing. This is the kind of uh, film that they should I honestly teach in film school. Michael Bay, some of these other guys that forget about a thing called plot, <laughs> forget about something called plot. Forget about foreshadowing. This is how you do it. This is how you build a movie. You layer it. It doesn't have to be all super cool effects and explosions and, you know, great CGI. Give me a story. And this story was amazing, man. I, I mean, you got anything else to say? I know I've been uh, 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 talking a whole bunch as usual. <laughs> I just want to say I also love the title of this film. I mean, this film just hits... It checks all the boxes. It could have been easy to call this film Brothers, or it could have been easy to call this film um, Retribution or something like that. But they decided to go with some not as obvious wall where it's that metaphor between the two brothers and what's going on. And not just that, but the wall between what really could have been their life if their dad could have stuck around and not gone through that and what actually was their life. I mean, there's so many different ways you can symbolize that title. I think it's a great title. I wonder if the director and the screenwriter of this movie were chasing this film the rest of their career because sometimes you have that one, you know, grand slam or that <laughs> six, those six sixes in one um, over type of a thing in your career and you're always chasing it. As far as a grade goes, it, it's, it's two words. It's A plus. That's you know what? A plus, regardless. I can't. I care. I don't care about the fake blood. So I don't care about the the campy fighting scenes or or the outdated fighting scenes. It's understandable for 1975. But as far as writing goes, holy cow, this movie's amazing, bro. I now I know why it's a classic, and I put it up there with some other classics, which I consider classics. I compared it to a Bronx Tale, one of my favorite movies. Uh, Robert De Niro, Chaz Palminteri. There's just I feel like so many American films have probably stolen because this is 1975. This is a really old film. Has stolen some bits and pieces from this because, like I said, the warehouse scene is so 
reminiscent of the sunny bar scene that's uncanny you're gonna have to go and watch if you've never seen that scene uh, uh guys watch it hopefully nick puts a link on here you guys can go watch it find um sunny a bronx tale and now use can't leave and then compare it to the warehouse scene and you're gonna be like oh man you know what i mean somebody should be paying somebody royalties or rights because they stole <laughs> it from the movie you know what i mean but uh yeah i'm with you brother a plus i know uh it's one of those things that with old films, a lot of times it, 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 it's hard to be able to say, okay, understand that the action scenes aren't going to be the same, but can you appreciate the story? I will say, though, at the very end, right, when VJ is trying to get to his mom, and I love that. He died in his mother's arms. He died in a place where he didn't want to go to. He went back up to the temple of the steps, but when he's driving away, Bro, I know it wasn't obviously the actor, uh, um, Shashi Kapoor that was on top of the car, but there was an actual actor on top of the or stuntman on top of that car, bro. And I'm sorry, he's hanging off the car. This is 1975. There ain't no CGI, uh, C CGI, so to speak. So that was pretty dangerous. So that was actually an impressive scene, in my opinion. Yeah, no, it was cool. I mean, everything about this movie was awesome. I absolutely loved it. And like I said, A+. Plus. Let us know what you think about this movie. Um, like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks again to Daniel and Gian for helping us out to be able to get um, access to this film. We hope that you're all staying safe out there. You're all doing good. I'm not going to say it yet, but in my mind, I'm thinking I may like Dewar even better than Cholet as far as the classic films go. Let us know. Get a debate going below. Which one's better? You can, you, uh, well, yeah, you guys go ahead and put it on our community page. I'll tell you right now, my vote is for Dewar. And this is not recency bias. bias. I will go and watch Chalet again. But when you talk about just character building, monologues, I mean, a, a, a whole bunch of, of very, very, very um, just unbelievable um, character arcs, there's just, no question. Forget about it. No question. And I, I, you got to go. In my opinion, you have to go with the war. But that's my opinion. Nick's right, though. We want to hear about your opinion, guys. So go ahead and let us know which one you prefer, Cholet or Dewar. And let us know if this is the film. I feel like this is the film that blew Big B up, man. Like, after people saw this at the movie theater, he went from eating Top Ramen, you know, the co-star <laughs> actor thing. He went from eating Top Ramen, bro, to eating. He's eating good. He's eating five-course meals and stuff, man. Papa dumps and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah well we we hope you enjoyed the review we we love watching the movie and we love talking about it and until next time we know things